Hey guys, and uh, yeah, welcome to another episode of the PH Journals podcast, the last one officially for 2023. I did a fantastic podcast on the previous episode uh, with Quid Prinsler, a very good friend of mine who's involved um, with the grass-fed beef, and just such an interesting dynamic and, and uh, way we had the conversation about how good grass pe- grass-fed beef is for you. Um, some fantastic details came out of that, and it really just just opened up a whole new world to um, relook at healthy habits and healthy eating going forward. And of course, uh, the impact it has on the environment, as well as from a conservation standpoint, was a fantastic discussion that we had. And I thought um, I couldn't leave on that note uh, with such a in-depth podcast. So I thought, well, let me come on here and share some lighter news and and do a little bit of uh, feedback on what's been going in and around uh, South Africa. And of course, to wish all my wonderful followers, um, sponsors, everyone that supported me this year, a very Merry Christmas. And I hope you guys have a prosperous new year. Um, So yeah, guys, basically this, this, the final episode um, for 2023 is just basically to say thank you and, of course, give you some really cool updates on what's been going on in the Nasda Forest with the elephants, as well as the new developments that have come out of um, up north, up in Limpopo. I think it's Madikwa Game Lodge uh, with the strawberry leopards. Some interesting facts on that. But before we get into it, just once again, a big shout out to everyone that supported me Splitting Image, Saxy Doomy, Scullies, Treason, Maxis Tires. Love Ties, PH Toolbox, everyone. It's been an absolute blast. I'm really looking forward to 2024 because we've got some exciting new sponsors coming up on board. And as well, our very first offshore sponsor that will be coming in from the US. I can't wait to share more details with you guys. Speaking of the US, we will be up in the United States from the 16th of January till the 8th of February. So if you guys have got any questions and you are on that side of the pond, hit me up. I would love to come and meet you guys. I will be at a couple of the shows. Unfortunately, I'll be missing Dallas Safari Club. I'm a lifetime member there, but unfortunately, I'll be missing that one. It's my daughter's birthday, so uh, priorities. They, she does come first. She's my little princess, and I'm really looking forward to that one. Um, but of course, we will be at SCR. I'm really that's one I'm most excited for. It's up in Nashville. And um, never been to Nashville, so I'm really looking forward to that one. So, but I will be in and around. I'll be based out of Phoenix, um, sorry, Arizona, more more around Phoenix area. So, if you guys got have got any questions and would like to meet up with me, hopefully, <clears throat> I'll be able to jump on a plane and get to you guys as soon as possible, and maybe come and do a few meet and greets. So, I'm looking forward to that one. Um, I'm hoping to touch base in Texas sometime during the during the course of our stay there. So, we're there for some time. So, I'm hoping to to tick a few boxes while we're there. So, guys, to get into this week's episode of the podcast. Um, we had a very interesting discussion and it's 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 one that that has come up it's been in the shadows and i thought well before i address this specific topic let me find out a little bit more about what's actually going on here and um it kind of correlates with a lot of species in africa and south africa that have been impacted by hunting indirectly um to make way for land and make way for habitat, get rid of the habitat so that we can have, um, <clears throat> so there can be more houses built, more farms run, um, forestry gets done, so it encroaches on these beautiful animals' habitat. Anyway, the story I'm talking about is the strawberry leopard. Well, now the strawberry leopard was. As, as far as my knowledge was concerned, back in Nasna, um, in the early 1900s, there were a few sightings of these, these leopard. Now, strawberry leopard apparently is smaller in body size, and of course the pigment um, in their skin doesn't give them the dark rosettes that we see on a normal leopard. Uh, it comes across as a much lighter rosette. Uh, the rosettes are those little uh, rose patches that are on the leopard, um, giving them the unique camouflage that they need um, in order to hunt and protect themselves. So 
<clears throat> the strawberry side of came where where they believed that the pigmentation within the leopard was um, not developing correctly and they kind of thought as it would have had sort of like an albino effect to these animals however new research and new discoveries up in Limpopo and in Pumalanga um, I think like I mentioned before I think it's at the Madikwa game lodge uh, where they have spotted several of these species, they've also highlighted them to be their own species, which is pretty cool. This is really, really cool, and there's only there's only a few of them around. Um, some scientists believe that the encroachments of the Nasna forest kind of killed um, the the strawberry leopard out. Um, however, finding these new developments up north in South Africa really bears the question to find out, are, have these cats been around here the whole time? Um, they are thought to be a little bit smaller than uh, their original counterparts, the normal leopard that we see on a constant basis, the Cape Leopard um, back down in Cape Town. So these new developments have been really, really exciting from, from a South African point of view because not only does, <laughs> it just adds a whole nother species into our arsenal. I mean, South Africa is renowned for having some top class species in, in the animal kingdom and, and now to go and add another side to a, one of the most <sighs> unbelievable predators that this world has to offer is really really cool and um of course sightings of these are rare at the moment but the more we understand and the more we develop understanding about these really cool animals um i'm guessing the more sightings that will come up and we can kind of pick up on patterns feeding patterns um along the way this is super exciting however um the backstory to me is what really gets me going and my blood boiling so <clears throat> also something that came out in roughly around about the same time um as the strawberry leopard uh, when the strawberry leopard was deemed to be extinct so too were the nars and the elephants now the reason for extinction and 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 if you go along to any of the google platforms and you 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 google nice and the elephants and you just read some of the transcripts that have come up from wikipedia it's kind of disheartening from a hunting point of view because it puts hunting in such a bad light um and you read some of the things that came from wikipedia um like the portuguese discovered the garden roots which is all good and well, <clears throat> however, um, ivory hunting and loss of habitat to agriculture had all uh, but ex exterminated the elephants from the Cape region of Africa in the 1900s. The last elephant in the vicinity of the Cape Peninsula was killed in 1704, and elephant populations west of Nasna region were um, extirpated prior to the 1800s. So it kind of doesn't really put hunting um, in such a good light. So yeah, however, they, they discovered more of these elephants and uh, elephant hunting was still regarded as a rather good sport. Prince Alfred, Duke of Edinburgh, Queen Victoria's son, accompanied by a large hunting party, arrived by ship to embark on an elephant hunt. The party killed two elephants and probably fatally wounded at least two other members of a herd now um captain harrison he was um part of the the forestry at the time and he was um commissioned to do uh the insight on these elephant which was pretty cool um and just you you need to understand back in in the 1800s the resources that these gentlemen had to do a proper evaluation on what was actually going on was very, very minimal. They had the minimal amount of, of tools. Um, they wouldn't dive deep into the forest. They would only go as far as their buggies or pickups or um, foot would get them. And then they would have to turn around and abort the expedition on numerous amounts of occasions. Um, however, there are documented pieces where these individuals had gone out and seen 
numbers and numbers and numbers of elephants. These elephants were roaming in these Nazna forests. Now, from what I understand, is once forestry took place because of the growing population in South Africa, once the forestry had to start place uh, take place for the demand in timber, um, they were chopping down some of the trees that have you know were protection and home to these magnificent beasts. <clears throat> Um, the elephants started becoming more and more um, vigilant in, in human settlements, causing problems. We know that's happening up north in Africa. It's happening all over the show where um, people are coming into contact with elephants and subsequently a lot of, a lot of human beings are losing their lives. Um, so in this particular case, these hunting trips that these individuals highlight in Wikipedia um, actually became expeditions to try and drive these elephants deeper into the forests so that they could use the land for agriculture. Now, I'm not saying and I'm not um, advocating for this. I'm not advocating for forestry. I'm not advocating for agricultural lands or anything like that. Um, I'm just saying... If there's an excuse to have why the population of elephants has been decimated over the past couple of years, other than poaching, hunting is not a very good excuse. Because logically, um, and if we refer back to uh, logically, okay, even in today's society, even back way back when we where let's go the early 2000s these amounts of elephants you would have to hunt and have the best equipment to hunt these animals to eradicate them so yeah it states um in 1876, Captain Harrison estimated 400 to 500 elephants remain in the region and is concerned by the rate um, at which the elephants are being killed by hunters. He makes an appeal to the Cape government for legislation to protect the Nazna elephants, which is denied um, as, as hardly worthwhile to legislate. So, <clears throat> 400 to 500 elephants that you would have to keep kill um, or decimate get rid of between 1876 and when they were really recorded in 18, in 1970 as extinct so you would have had to kill more than one elephant every single year and for me in the space of the Nazna forest without resources to push those elephants as deep as what they went I mean, still to this day, I don't know if she's still alive, but there was one remaining um, female. My knowledge tells me that to eradicate 400 to 500 elephants from a hunting perspective seems kind of impossible in a space of 100 years. Um, for me, that is, that is highly unlikely. Of course, we have to factor in um, the, the poaching. We have to factor that in. Um, the the decimation of, of habitat, obviously driving these elephants off, what are they dying from? Um, in those, <clears throat> uh, I think during the World War, the, the Nazna forest fires, there was huge fires that could have had a massive impact in the population as well. But if we all add this up, there's, there's no ways that I believe with the less amount of resources that they had to actually physically hunt these animals um, and or even poach them for their valued ivory trade. Um, I highly doubt that these animals were driven off solely because of hunting. There were so many other different factors that came into play and it boils down to a case where I think it was kind of like the Wild West as far as agriculture was concerned, forestry, because there's there's all this big boom going on. You know, South Africa is becoming the hub. The Portuguese are there. The Dutch are there. The English are there. They're driving these agendas into these Cape provinces because they want to trade spices and um, make the trading routes along the Cape Peninsula the, the desired trade routes. And they wanted to get involved, however... It came at a price, and it came at a price of so many different species, one of them being the strawberry leopard, and as well, 
as the knights and the elephants. However, still to this day, I believe that uh, a strawberry leopard um, has probably got thriving populations within the Nazna forest still. And so too have elephants. Um, <clears throat> you know, a pure example is the forest elephants up in the Congo. Uh, there's Congo, Cameroon, um, you know, Congo, Cameroon, Angola. There's these forestry elephants that you hardly ever see. They're much smaller than their, their normal counterparts, but you hardly ever see them. They roam vast, vast forestry uh, areas within these countries, and very, very few sightings actually come up. So I, I personally believe, given enough time, given enough effort, given enough funding and uh, resources, for scientists to actually go in and discover a lot more what's going on in the Nazna forest, I think we might surprise ourselves and actually have these beautiful animals still living within um, within the forestry areas. Um, however, again, pointing back and, and pointing fingers to hunters really just puts the hunting industry in a bad light. Because whether we like it or not, the, um, <clears throat> the interest in the strawberry leopard is going to have uh, reciprocating research uh, and it is going to have situations where people are going to dive in and, and and google and search the internet for answers and 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 questions and all that sort of stuff and they're going to come across the knives and the elephant stories and that and and my concern my personal concern is that at that specific time hunting is going to be seen yet again in a very very bad light when I believe that there are so many different factors that all played a part into destroying the habitat, destroying the magnificent species of the Nazna elephant. So, <clears throat> you know, I don't want to end off on, on, a, on a negative note, but when, when, when all is considered, um, we have to understand that, yes, of course, back in those days, conservation practices were very, very minimal and um, weren't the best at the time. I fully agree with that. However, I don't think that between 1876 and 1970, um, hunting could could have solely decimated or destroyed the elephant population. So without any recording and without any evidence of the strawberry leopard, um, as far as numbers is concerned, we also don't know how they have built themselves up to i mean just the other day there was a report on the internet that uh, they had found another seven of these strawberry leopards um, and those of you that have come out to south africa that have seen leopard encounters it's 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 a it's a wonderful it's a magnificent scene to see just just to even have them in your presence is just so overwhelming but other than that to see a, a species that has been believed to be extinct for, for centuries to come back is kind of awe-inspiring. But at the same time, we need to understand now, okay, what is our next step as far as conserving these magnificent beasts or trying to build up their, their population to a strong and healthy one where we can kind of then play around? And this is what it is. And, and it boils back to um, where... <clears throat> like I said, and I'll, I'll say it again and I'll say it a thousand times more, hunting is by far the best conservation tool we have to offer. But at what point do we incorporate it? And that leaves us leading, um, leading individuals in this industry to make these calls. We can't keep relying on individuals up in offices clicking pens to make these calls because it's not working. So now, at one point, once all these discoveries have happened, scientific research has been done, um, and all of this stuff has really built up to a, a really positive outcome, at what point, as a hunting community, do we start getting involved? We're already sitting with a situation where leopard tags in South Africa are are non-existent i wouldn't say non-existent because you can get a couple but for instance um it's going to be a point where cattle farmers sheep farmers are going to start poisoning these animals 
and throwing them down water holes and stuff like we have seen in the past. And it's important for us to highlight these situations that's going on because we need to drive an agenda so that we can protect these animals. And like I said before, is that once we release enough tags, it compensates the farmers for the loss of animals. So, I mean, a leopard, if we're hunting a leopard for $30,000, which I kind of think is the market price at the moment, um, if we're hunting a leopard for $30,000 and we compensate that farmer a certain percentage of that 30000 and he's lost six or seven cattle in the process, it really it makes a massive impact. It incentivizes that farmer to not put out poison, to not make an effort to get rid of these animals. And that's what we need to strive towards. And that's my concern with the elephants if they are going to be coming back into population because there was one female recorded. Um, however, unfortunately, no males. Um, <clears throat> but now with the strawberry leopard, at what point do we need to start saying, oh, hang on here, guys? Because if we look at this from a nutshell point, point of view, if the strawberry leopard is recorded to be smaller than um, the Cape leopard counterparts, um, they're going to be driven into areas where they're going to have to fend for themselves. So, so where the normal leopards are predominantly dominant and territorial um, in your high volume cases such as parks, um, game reserves, a couple of game farms out there. The strawberry leopards are going to be driven into these areas in South Africa where the easier and the more um, less physically demanding game is to hunt. And what is that? Cattle farmers, sheep farmers, um, all these different farmers along the way. So, and they're going to become enemy number one. So at what point do we intervene? And, that, and that, that's my point going forward now is that this is all fantastic news. It really is. I mean, to to open up my cell phone and to and to get um, a notification about strawberry leopard discovered up in Limpopo and Pumalanga, wherever it was, my mind immediately triggers towards what is our next step. Because we need to look after these animals. Because before we wipe the shit out of ours, we can decimate them yet again. Because they're on that, <clears throat> um, that knife edge, that fine line. They walk in that fine line. And we need to look after them. Because if we're going to want them to be around for generations. My father never saw a strawberry leopard. Yet I sit here today and I have the perfect opportunity to go up to these game farms and see a strawberry leopard for myself. And I want that to relay down to my daughter and her, her kids to come and grandkids and all that sort of stuff. So... As a hunter, it's important not to be self-minded. And what I mean by that is that don't look for the now. Don't look for the tomorrow. But look for the next generation. And maybe even the generation after that. Because then you know we're instilling good conservation practices. And although in some of these reports... They highlight hunting in a bad light. It probably pays testament to how important conservation should have been back then. And did they make it priority number one? If they did, would have we had a different outcome? Although I don't believe that hunting is fully responsible for that. But would we have had a different outcome? These are questions we need to ask. And get experts on and have give them the platform for us to ask these questions and understand where this is all going because we don't want to make the mistakes. The best part about this is that we have the opportunity now to learn from the mistakes in the past and drive an agenda forward to better our conservation practices for future generations to come. And that is what I'm thriving on and that is what I'm driven towards because I don't want tomorrow to be okay. I want the next generation to be 
our forefathers took a step in the right direction. They looked after, number one, an industry that's given us so much positivity as far as conservation, healthy eating, healthy lifestyles are concerned. And number two is preserving and conserving. And that's the mindset we have to have going forward because it's becoming it's becoming so relevant in today's age. And my biggest fear as a professional hunter, as a conservationist, when I sit here in front of this camera tonight, my biggest fear is that from my daughter's generation and the generation to follow, there might not be anything left. And a legacy we have built up and worked so hard to fight for will be eradicated in a short, very short space of time. And it breaks my heart to think like that, and I try not to. But the fact of the reality is, is that we need to keep ourselves motivated and determined to prevent that from happening. So yeah, but guys, I didn't want to end off on a, on a negative note. Um, <clears throat> like I said, it's exciting news coming out. Strawberry leopard population is back. It's look, it looks like it's going to be picking up and getting healthy again. I'm super excited about it. And I'm hoping to do a podcast like this next year where I turn to you guys and say, there's another 10 of these animals roaming around in our African bushveld. So I'm excited about it and I'm really, really looking forward to it. So once again, guys, before I close on the final episode on 2023, um, I want to take this opportunity to say thank you to every one of you that has supported me. For <laughs> I mean, it, it gives me a bit of a lump in the throat when I get photos of people listening to the podcast because if I ever had to imagine, imagine myself four years ago sitting where I'm sitting right now, I would have called you guys a liar. But to sit here, be the number one podcast, hunting podcast in South Africa for three years in a row, to have jumped 20 places in a space of 12 or 13 months, whatever it is, and to almost break that top 20 is a dream come true and I would have never ever had done it without you guys so for myself I just want to say thank you for everything it really means the world to me um, and if you haven't yet I would appreciate to touch the subscribe button if you enjoy this episode drop a thumbs up because all of this helps in the long run <sighs> I want to take this opportunity as well to wish you guys all a Merry Christmas and once again a prosperous New Year. I'm hoping to resume the podcast in the middle of January. Hopefully I'll have my very good friend, or Pat Dugan, he's become a regular on the podcast. Um, hopefully we'll be able to touch base and, and, and get in touch with you guys um, on booking your next safari and I'm really, really looking forward to that one. So if you are, for the final time in 2023, if you are, happy hunting. Until then, stay safe, stay blessed, stay humble. We'll catch up with you guys soon. Cheers.